back in 2015, over seven years ago, I presented at the Family Office Forum to Family Offices in Zurich, Switzerland. The topic of the speech was how family offices can invest directly in private companies. Anyway, I recently found footage from that speech, well, most of the speech. So I thought I'd share it with you. Here it is. Hope you like it. Now is the important part. You need to hustle. This is what the private equity funds are doing. They hire tons of analysts, associates. Their principals are out there meeting everybody. You need to be doing this as well. What I would recommend is once you have that expertise, once you're at that level where you understand the industry, be proactive. Contact the CEOs of the companies you want to buy. Contact the owners of the companies you want to buy. You know, don't only contact people that are selling. Start building the relationships with the companies you like. You know, they'll want to meet you. After all, like Stephen said before me, you're a provider of capital, right? Tell them you want to provide equity capital, debt capital. Talk to them on the same level about their business. Ask them about their strategies. Show them you understand their business. They will want to meet you. And when they meet, when they meet you, make sure it's a win-win when you meet them. So they want to meet you again. And then they want to meet you again. And meet these people. Let's say there's 15 companies that you really like. Meet the leaders of these companies every two to three months. So that a year, two years, whenever it is, when they're ready to sell or ready to put an infusion of capital into their business, they contact you. Now, I have a good example where I'm going to tell you that I've done and this has worked for me, but we're going to make you wait about another five, 10 minutes until it's a little later in the presentation. So the point I'm giving you now is through specialization, you can get proprietary deal flow. Not the deal flow that investment bankers send you, not the deal flow that business brokers send you, the deal flow that you're proactively getting yourself. Next, we're going to talk about due diligence. Now, I call this section due diligence, but it's more I'm going to talk about valuation. Now, at the university, I also teach a valuations course. This valuation course takes about 12 weeks to teach, about 36 hours in total time. I have about three to five minutes of valuation time with you guys. So I'm going to do my best to condense that, okay, just to get um, my point across on valuation. Bless you. And, once, uh, and after this presentation, please feel free to come talk to me. I'd love to go in more detail on valuation if you'd like. So let's use an example. I'm going to put this guy down for a second. Oh, that's going to fall. That's not good. Okay, so let's use an example. Okay, you want to buy a business. The business costs $40 million. Okay, $40 million, and it has $5 million in EBITDA. Now, most of you know what EBITDA is, earnings before interest tax, depreciation, amortization. We're using that as a representative of the income from the company. We can argue whether we want to use EBITDA or we want to adjust it. Do we want to adjust it for one-time expenses? Do we want to adjust it for CapEx? Maybe the company has issues with networking capital. Maybe we want to adjust EBITDA for that. For the purpose of this uh, example, we're just going to say $5 million in EBITDA. It costs $40 million. Now, this business is a business I like. I like businesses with cash flow. Why do I like businesses with cash flow? Because we can borrow against them. So with this business, we end up having our 40 million, but we go to the bank. The bank lends us money at four times EBITDA. Remember, EBITDA was 5 million. Four times that, we're all good at math. That's $20 million. So we borrow from the bank $20 million of debt, and we put in our own 20 million of equity. Now, the bank gives us that money at 5%. 5% of 20 million is one percent, uh, sorry, is $1 million. So now let's look at how this works. So we're gonna put in 20 million of our own money, right? 20 million of the bank's money. And on our own money, we're gonna get 5 million minus the 1 million a year we pay the bank. We're gonna get 4 million. So without the bank, we put in 4 million and we get 5 million, right? That's eight times EBITDA or a 12.5% return. If we end up using leverage, we end up with a 20% levered return. Now, the question you got to ask yourself, is a 20% return good? And the answer is, you don't have enough information yet. So your minds are in this you know, global economy where how are we going to get you know, 20% on, on public investments? How like bonds, those are extremely low rate. 20% must be good. But when you're investing in private companies, there's a lot more risk. Just like any alternatives, whenever you have a return, you need to weigh it over the risks. So there's a few things that you need to look at specifically. One is comparables. 
should already know this stuff, this should be a review, right? You're trading at eight times. Well, what are your competitors trading at? Are they trading at five times, six times, 10 times? What's the industry trading at? What is the industry trading at relative to other industries? If it's trading at a low level, that doesn't automatically mean these are great returns. It might mean that there's new technology that might eliminate this industry. Who knows? Look at comparables to try to find signs of how the company is valued and where the industry is going. Next, we're gonna look at future cash flows. Now, a lot of family offices are scared of this discounted cash flow model. They're scared of this whole thing about modeling, right? So what you end up doing is you end up hiring someone to do it for you. And then that person, what they'll do is they'll look at the sales number, they'll look at the industry as a whole, they'll look at competitors, and they'll say sales are gonna increase at 3% or 4% or 2% or whatever it is. Then they'll use expenses. They'll say expenses are 70%. And they've been, historically, they've been 70% of sales. So in future, it's gonna be 70. And then there'll be some synergies and it's gonna be 65, right? So what you need to do, if you're gonna spend the time to do this directly, you need to really understand what's gonna affect sales and what's gonna affect every line of those expenses. If you don't understand this stuff, hire someone who understands it or don't invest directly in private companies. When you look at sales, understand the details. How, what's the customer concentration like? Are 50% of sales coming from one customer? If so, is that customer under a 20 year contract, under a four month contract? Is the rate of the contract higher than market, below market? Is a customer, um, is a, you have a diverse customer base where the most concentrated customer is only 2%. You need to look at these factors when you forecast out sales. When you're looking at expenses, look at office rent. Do you have an office that's built for 200, built for 200 employees but only have 50 employees? Why? Is there expected growth? Or do you have an office for 200 employees but you have 300 employees? And is this entrepreneur that's trying to sell the business trying to pack all his expenses in, he knows he needs to put money in the business, but he makes your EBITDA look good. And if your EBITDA looks good, you're not really paying eight times or getting a 12.5% return or getting a 20% levered return. So that's all I'm gonna talk about valuation, right? When it comes to due diligence, you need to understand all the things of the companies. And once you do, you combine this with the fact that you've been meeting the CEOs and you've been meeting the owners and you understand their motivations. You always wanna understand the motivations of a seller. If you're gonna buy a company, you need to know who you're buying the company from. Okay, so let me tell you a story on how I was able to understand motivations to get a good deal on a company. So this guy, I, I, like, I like going for beers and this guy liked going for beers. So we would go for beers every two to three months for about a year and a half. So the last few meetings we had, he would tell me, he's like, you know, Steve, my business is at this level and the strategics are at this level. I need a big infusion of capital to get to the next level. Now, if I took the money, you know, I, I don't really want to take it in the form of debt. I'm an entrepreneur. I've never taken debt on this business. I don't want to do that. I could get, you know, I, I could sell a part of my business, but it's my business. You know, I don't want to give it up. So he's like, you know what? I think I'm going to sell. You know, we've been talking for about a year and a half. What do you think? So I knew we had a relationship because we've been meeting, you know, for the last year and a half. But come on, just because we've been meeting doesn't mean he's going to give me a better price, right? He's obviously going to try to get the most of his business. So I said, why don't you go out and why don't you see what you can get for the business? But do me a favor, give me the opportunity to beat the price that you're given. So a couple of months later, we met again. This time, not in the bar, this time, boardroom comes on he's like okay i have three offers i have two strategics and one private equity fund the private equity fund that gave the offer had a platform and they were just using this as an add-on acquisition so all three offers were to buy his entire business tell him he can stay on for two years you know tell him don't worry don't worry you'll have a role in this and then let him go with a non-compete it was clear that they had their own teams to do this but they were offering X. He comes back to me, he's like, these guys are offering X. Can you beat it? I said, overall, yes, I can beat it. You're gonna get Z. But you're not gonna get Z up front. You're gonna get Y first. I know you well. You're 45 years old. You are not ready to retire. You would love to be part of this expansion. And I understand you don't wanna take debt on. And I understand your issue with, you know, selling a little bit of equity, but hear me out. If I buy it for Y, I will give you an incentive scheme 
so that when, when we infusion of capital, when we do the expansion, the company will be worth Z, and you will get a bigger payout than you, ha than you would have gotten from the strategics. After that, you will be our go-to guy. You've seen us do this in many different portions of the country. We are going to continue doing this, and you will have the same incentive scheme for the different companies that we buy. So because of that, he accepted, and we were able to buy well. So the main advantage you have as a family office going directly into private companies is the idea that you're flexible. You can be these relationships, right? You can have, you can customize creative deals, take advantage of it. Finally, I have my last slide. You know, I talk about, actually a slide, it's not my last slide. One of my last slides on value differentiation. I'm just kind of bringing out the points that I said earlier. Now, when you're creating value in a deal, you want to use the same things that a lot of the private equity funds are doing. You want to have uh, synergies. You want to look at you know, being efficient with your costs. You want to look at the industry specific. Should you do a geographic expansion? Should you do a product expansion? You want to do all these things, right? But the reason you're going by yourself instead of, or with your team, instead of with a private equity firm is because, again, you're able to be more flexible and you might be able to use some of your subject matter expertise. Some of your expertise that you have from uh, you know, your previous life, from your previous business, a lot of you might have family businesses, try to find business that's complementary, and then you can use it to differentiate. Maybe you can create synergies with your existing business or whatever. So there's one last point I wanna to talk to you about, which is very important. And this is more for the family offices that haven't invested in private companies before, and that's the ability to execute. The number one reason why family offices don't invest directly in companies is not because they don't think they can get proprietary deal flow. It's not because they don't think they can buy well, right? It's because once they buy, they're not sure that they can execute. Because at the end of the day, the private equity funds are in business because they've done this many, many times. So family offices are like, man, I gotta go do this? Whoa, 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 you know what? I'll just get to this point. You're like, you know what? I'm just gonna get you know, the private, I'm just gonna invest in a private equity fund. Well, don't do that. I have a good example that's gonna inspire you. And I'm just gonna get a time check. Do we have enough time for my good example? Yeah, okay, we have enough time for my good example. Okay, great. So about five minutes from where I grew up. So I grew up in Toronto, Canada. Grew up five minutes from the head office of Ontario Teachers Pension Plan. So Ontario is a province where Toronto's located. Hopefully some of you guys know that, right? So I grew up five minutes from the head office of Ontario Teachers Pension Plan. And in the early 90s, they were the first pension to invest directly into private companies. And in their first investment, they failed. Their second investment, they failed. But they learned from it, they kept moving forward. Today, Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, the investment arm, which is now called Teachers Private Capital, has over $145 billion assets under management. It has one of the best track records out of any pension plan due to its direct investing. And INSEAD, a school in France, I'm sure you guys know that one, wrote a case about it that I use in my classes. Not only that, in the mid-2000s, Canada Pension Plan, or CPPIB, the investment arm of Canada Pension Plan. I know it's Canada, but it's not small. 268 billion assets under management. They poached one of the top guys from teachers to implement a direct investing plan into CPPIB, and Harvard wrote a case about that as well. Now, if teachers didn't take that step to try to invest directly in private equity, if they were afraid of executing, they would never have the returns they have today. So if this is an issue for you, start small. The details of a $5 million deal are the same as a $50 million deal. Try a $5 million deal. If it doesn't work, well, hopefully you have a lot more than $5 million that you're spending. Don't spend all your $5 million. But if you have a lot more than $5 million, try a small deal like $5 million. And if it doesn't work, okay, well, what did you learn from this? Is this something that you enjoy? Is this something that you think you can be successful at? Is this something that your team can be successful at? If so, keep going at it until you succeed. This is how you'll learn if this is going to work for you. So anyway, back to what I was saying in value differentiation, make sure that you can add unique value to a deal you do. Okay, so that's me, a lot of talking. Let me just make sure you remember everything I was saying. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna remember three main points. Okay, we're gonna remember that we're gonna specialize because we're not gonna accept these deals from investment bankers. 
right? And if we are, we're going to have someone that works for us look through all thousand of them to find only a couple. We're not going to look at all of them and think they're all for us. We're going to go find proprietary deal flow. Next, due diligence. We're going to make sure we understand how to value a company just as good as any private equity fund can. And if we can't understand that, we're going to hire someone who can. And what we're going to do when we buy is we're going to customize solutions for the companies that are selling so that we can buy at a better price. And finally, we're going to use value differentiation. We're all, I shouldn't say we're all, you're all very intelligent people. Right? You've all made your money through family businesses in different ways. Right? You can add that unique value through what you know today and your ability to be flexible. All this stuff has a universal application. Whether you're in Switzerland, whether you're in Germany, whether you're in the UK, or whether you're in Canada, all of these principles will apply. So please, if you have any questions whatsoever, I'm available at lunch. You can email me, or I'll open the floor for questions now. Thank you.